Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to another program in the series Community Camera, brought to you by the Learning Resources Center of Corning Community College. We're very fortunate in uh, being able to bring you today the first in our 1979-80 Visiting Scholar series around the theme America into the 80s. I'll uh, be saying a little bit more about that later, but my guest today is Mr. Jules Whitcover of the Washington Star. Uh, I know many in our uh, viewing area read his column, and uh, author uh, of Marathon on the 1976 election, and of many articles on past and present uh, campaign dealing with politics into the 80s, which is the theme of his visit here at Corning. Uh, Mr. Wickover, welcome to Community Camera. Thank you. Glad to be here. How, uh, how has your stay gone? I often ask scholars as we start out, uh, their impressions of us before we well it's been uh, it's been active um, I don't think I've uh, I've I've talked so much um, uh, since I uh, tried to talk my kids into um, into uh, going to school themselves uh, it uh, it's been very interesting to to, to uh, uh, see the level of interest in politics uh, on this particular campus uh, I travel a lot around around the country, uh, speaking on some college campuses, and I think that the, the level of interest compares very, very favorably here to what I've seen elsewhere in the country. This campaign is beginning to look like it's going to be a little more of a barn burner than some of the past ones, doesn't it? Well, it certainly does, since uh, since Senator Kennedy has given his uh, quote hints that he may be a candidate. Uh, I think it certainly has uh, increased uh, interest in, in the campaign, and uh, I think that's a good thing. I think uh, one of the things we've suffered from in the past is, is the apathy of people that's reflected both in, in how much attention they pay to, to a campaign and their failure to vote uh, at, the, at the end of it. Well, I, I think it's a good thing, too, and you've expressed a number of times your interest in increased participation as, a, as part of making the whole process viable. But on the other hand, it, it certainly is... Um, another indication of the importance of personality politics that this one man has had the capacity to do more to really turn up the level of interest in this campaign than anything else that's happened. Well, that's very true and um, you know you, you, you can deplore that and, and hope that uh, people would pay more attention to the issues in, in campaigns and involve themselves but the fact of the matter is really that uh, you know, particularly in the age of television where people are distracted with so many other things and so many other things to do and, and pay attention to that really does take uh, the dynamism of an individual to really, really capture the public's attention. The hope is that when you have such such uh, dynamic figures, that they can, by their attraction, uh, discuss issues and get people to to, to pay attention. You're a, a prominent writer and columnist. You are. Uh, I don't know what your syndication is, but certainly uh, you're a national columnist. Are you conscious of? of wielding a great deal of power? Do you feel you are a, an opinion molder? Well, when I look at the, when I look at the results of elections quite often, I have, I have severe doubts about that. I mean, uh, uh, no, I don't, I don't really try to think about it in, in, in those terms. Um, uh, I come out of a repertorial experience rather than, than being a pundit. And the focus of, of all my work in journalism has been reporting and not uh, trying to uh, impose my, uh, my opinions on, on other people. Uh, I think that um, I continue to try to, to, to take that approach, as does my partner in our column. And uh, I mean, there are just so many, so, so many other pressures on politicians that determine what they do, that the, uh, the impact of what, or what one particular column may say about them uh, really, I think, is kind of infin infinitesimal in terms of the, of the whole range of of uh, political uh, pressures and impacts on a political figure. I'm going to pay, I guess, a, a compliment to the uh, to those uh, to you and those who deal in the in the printed word, as opposed to the electronic uh, your electronic counterparts. And I've said this to some of the television personalities on the program too. I, I think reading a column or reading a, a newspaper account is by the very process of translating the written symbols into thoughts and being able to control the pace with which you read it, think about it, a different process than watching something on television, and in general, a more thoughtful process. I, um, I, I tend to agree with that, and I certainly hope that that's correct. Uh, 
certainly it's uh, in terms of the of the amount of information that you can, you can convey with with the space that you have as opposed to the to the, the time that the average uh, uh, television uh, analyst has we, we have, certainly have a, a greater opportunity in in the printed media uh, also i think it takes more of a commitment on the part of of the the person on the other end whether he's uh, if he's a reader of of newspapers uh, to commit himself to sit down and 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 tolerate what what you're trying to to throw at him to to uh, absorb it and think about it whereas it's very easy to um, to turn to turn television on for 10 seconds or so and and get a, get the highlights and turn it off i think also because television is so conscious about holding the the viewer at all times because there is that option of turning off or going to another channel um, that there is perhaps not a sufficient willingness to deal with with subjects in some depth that may not uh, be particularly jazzy whereas when you're writing a newspaper column uh, the very fact that the person is sitting down and and and, re and committing himself to what you have to say I think gives you a chance to at least have his attention not to say that people don't pick up a newspaper read one paragraph and uh, and mm -hmm. toss it aside but if that happens that's just as much uh, our fault I think for not being interesting mm -hmm. as it is for the reader not having a uh, a longer attention span. Just to to add to that point, uh, when you when you mentioned it once before, I think you said that television is apt not to feature a story that doesn't have pictorial content, and that that in a way is in itself a, a prejudicing factor as to what is highlighted on television. Yes, it is. After all, a visual medium. It has to have something to go with the words, and it has to have something that will keep people's attention. Many times, in in politics, at least. Uh, uh, a, dis a discussion of issues is not pictorial and is not graphic and is not really particularly arresting. It's it's uh, so it's a problem for how of how television is able to to take such su subject matter and 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 adapt it to television, make it interesting. My own feeling is that uh, television hasn't done that very well mm -hmm. uh, to date, and something that it, that it really needs to do, because I personally believe that because uh, most people, as surveys show, decide whether they're going to vote and how they're going to vote on the basis of what they see on television, that if you're going to, to increase uh, voter participation, which I think is essential, uh, it's going to have to be done by television making, making politics uh, more graphic and, uh, and more attractive and therefore uh, be able to inform at a greater depth than television has done to date. One of my concerns certainly as an educator and, and, and dealing with young people, and that's certainly a part of the job I like, and I have very positive feelings, really, about them in general, uh, in spite of the increasing age gap. But you said that only about 25% of them are, are registering and voting. And after the successful move to get the voting age lowered, which did reach fruition, that's a little discouraging. That's very discouraging to me. Uh, and it's 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 uh, generally in that uh, lower age group, uh, both college trained and non college trained uh, young people. Um, it's perhaps more understandable that that uh, uneducated youth, as un uneducated people of any age, uh, don't uh, see what their self interest is in voting. But for for but for college educated students to turn their back on the on the ballot box, it seems to me uh, uh, incredible and, and stupid. Uh, particularly because in an era when we have low turnout, uh, that very fact um, magnifies the importance of, of a single vote. And if, and if you don't vote, the people who do are going to have that much more power. If they vote the way you want them to, that's fine. But if they don't, mm -hmm. and very often they don't, uh, you are you are really hurting yourself t uh, twofold by by not voting. Another thing that worries me, a little different subject, is that our courses here at the college that deal with Foreign studies, our Asian history or our African history or our foreign languages or our foreign geography courses have very little enrollment. Now, we're supposed to have a very concerned and, and informed younger generation, and yet they seem very uninterested in other parts of the world. Uh, that uh, seems to worry me. It's, it, it's kind of a uh, universal phenomenon, I think. I think it exists also with, with the older generation. Uh, yes, the, I think the reason uh, is I think we've got uh, we, we're a very inward-looking country now because we have so many mm -hmm. severe problems internally that affect our own lives: inflation, uh, the recession, uh, energy problems, unemployment. All these things uh, hit people in their personal lives in a very, very direct way. Uh, I think a, a 
perhaps uh, one of the best measurements of, of that is that uh, when, when President Carter uh, almost single-handedly uh, brought about uh, uh, a settlement in the Middle East between the Egyptians and the Israelis, um, there was great uh, enthusiasm expressed for that achievement, and yet uh, very shortly thereafter when a, when a, a poll was taken of his, of his uh, strength, it indicated that he had gone up in the polls 1%. Which suggests that uh, that people don't really care that much about foreign policy, even even when rather spectacular uh, progress has been made. Must be pretty disconcerting to come out and do uh, your your biggest trick of the whole magic show and find the audience is just giving you polite applause. Imagine. Probably his. Well, we're on the eve of 1980. Your subject here is politics into the 80s. Uh, it looks like a more than usually uh, interesting presidential year coming up. I know you've been through this many times, but let's take a look at the at the two parties and their and their prospects. Uh, do you think um, that uh, we're assuming that Kennedy's a candidate, aren't we? Is that, is that a given now? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, your position on his prospects? Well, I think if the um, if the if the nomination were held tomorrow, I think he'd be the nominee. Uh, I think that. Uh, I draw the conclusion on the, both on the basis of, of tremendous uh, personal popularity of Senator Kennedy around the country and also the tremendous vulnerability of President Carter, uh, which is clearly reflected in the polls. He's, he's lower in the, in the polls than, than President Nixon was at the time of his That's resignation. Amazing, isn't it? And I also, I also feel that, uh, that uh, the, the, but the president doesn't seem to have much opportunity to turn that around. When I look ahead over the next several months, I don't see what uh, what there is uh, on the agenda that, that could help him to make a radical change. Certainly, the state of the economy is not going to be righted overnight or even close to that. And his energy package in Congress uh, has been watered down uh, considerably already, probably will be more so. And uh, his other major legislative uh, uh, effort, uh, uh, ratification of the, in the Senate of the SALT talks, uh, SALT treaty seems to be in more trouble than ever because of, of, of uh, various problems, uh, including the, um, the recent uh, uh, hassle over, over Russian troops in Cuba. I was going to say that perhaps if he led an amphibious operation in Cuba in person, it might, <laughs> might do something. But Let's hope not. No, I, I hope not. And I'm not, I, I think the man is, is an honest man, and I think he, his integrity, I, I really don't see him using the Cuban no. situation politically. No, I, don't. I, hope, I hope not. But uh, it is going to take something dramatic, I think, to, to bail him out. And as I say, I don't really see anything on the horizon that, uh, of that magnitude that, that, that can do it. Uh, it's kind of ironic that uh, four years ago we were talking about uh, the, the desire for a man of honesty and integrity above all else, a man we could trust. Uh, president Carter, as a candidate, seemed to, to, to meet that requirement. And as a president, I think he's, he's met that requirement. But uh, I think we forget very easily what we've had in the recent past, and and now that the the yearning is is not so much for those qualities as as it is for somebody who's decisive and strong and can get things done, and I think that is what the appeal of, of Senator Kennedy is, as a, uh, beyond the other elements of his appeal, which go to his family name and and desires to go back to the Kennedy years and so on. And I think it also helps other other candidates. Um, such as uh, John Connolly, who has an image of being mm -hmm. strong, and to a degree also Ronald Reagan, who has had a reputation of being very tough on foreign policy. Mm -hmm. What do you, uh, some people, I, I hear conflicting analyses, as you would expect, though there are still many who say that Reagan's record as governor of California was quite credible. Well, I think uh, my feeling, I've looked at it a few times, is that it's, um, it's better than uh, his critics uh, say it, it was, and, uh, and not as good as he says it was. <laughs> But um, I think uh, for somebody who was dismissed as just a movie star, I think uh, his, his record was at least uh, more impressive than people would have expected him to. I guess that would be true of my, of my own ass assessment. I didn't expect it to be as solid as it was, though. But I really think his appeal is not so much in, in, in any particular things that he did as governor of California, is that he seems to, to embody uh, the, 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 the sense of a, of a middle-class resentment in the society that has been uh, exerting itself in various ways, including Proposition 13 in California, and other, other efforts to, 
to uh, cut the government down to size, particularly by, by middle class voters who feel that they've been ex uh, taxed excessively uh, for, for things that, for which they, uh, they receive no benefit. It's, all, it's a part of that same inward looking attitude uh, in, in the electorate, uh, which I talked uh, a minute ago. Mm -hmm. And that's going to definitely be the focus of this campaign, not foreign policy. Well, I certainly would think so if it gets down to, to a race between, uh, between uh, Governor Reagan and Senator Kennedy. Uh, Reagan will, will be, in, 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 some case, in some senses, that would be a very interesting race because it would be very clear cut. You'd have uh, on the Republican side with, with Governor Reagan uh, a man taking uh, pretty much uh, doctrinaire uh, ideological positions on the right about uh, the government getting too big, or tax, uh, taxation too high, uh, government interference too great, um, uh, softness on, uh, on, so on various recipients of social welfare programs, the desire to be let alone. Uh, and on the other side, Senator Kennedy, in, in, a, in a sense, trying to, uh, to uh, reawaken the concerns that, uh, that fueled uh, the appeal of his brother and of, of other liberal Democrats like Hubert Humphrey. That is, the, the whole concept of, of a government with a heart that will perform services for people uh, that they can't perform for themselves and that, uh, uh, that uh, can only be done by government. There's an interesting move afoot, it's not, it's not new, but it's getting a little play lately about the, the six-year term for president. Some people think eight years is too long, but, but ironically, uh, it's surfacing at a time where, as I think you pointed out the other day, in the last 20 years, we haven't had a president serve eight years. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm not uh, particularly sympathetic with that idea of a six-year presidency. Uh, in large part because of the experience we've had uh, in the last several years. I just, I just feel more comfortable uh, knowing that, that the voters will have a crack at deciding whether a president is, is doing the job or should be removed every four years. Uh, I just don't have, a, have enough um, confidence in, in the, either the wisdom um, or the, um, the honesty of, of uh, public figures generally uh, to, uh, to, to want to extend that period uh, when, when we can't make a judgment on a, another, another two years. I'm not particularly concerned about the argument that, that presently, uh, because we only have a four-year term, uh, presidents almost immediately start to campaign and spend too much time of their time politicking, and that that wouldn't happen uh, in a six-month, in a six-year term. I think that um, the, the good politician, politics from the very beginning, whether it's a four-year term or whatever, and the way he politics, if he's a good politician, is, is, is to be a good president, try to get good things done. Uh, it's, it's, it's usually when a president has failed that uh, he starts to, uh, uh, to, to deal in, in other ways, whether it's rhetoric or corner cutting or whatever. Uh, and when that happens, I think it's, it's, it's important that the, that the electorate decide uh, uh, in a relatively uh, short time whether the whether the president um, should be continued or not. Somebody uh, the other day here proposed uh, a two-year term for the president. Uh, you know, carrying on a little bit with what I had said, I, I I just think that would be uh, much too short a time to get an, uh, an, allow a president to get his feet on the ground and to get something going. Some of our viewers will remember a recent program I did with Senator William Smith, our state senator uh, from this area. Uh, in New York State, even the upper house is on a two-year term, mm -hmm. and he feels that's a little too short. He mm -hmm. says he feels they really are campaigning every time they turn around. I think a six-year term is either too long or too short for a president, depending on, mm -hmm. on, on how he's doing. I think right now maybe what we need, if we can get the right person, the right kind of popular support, is an eight-year president. Uh, we haven't had one in 20 years. There's been a great deal of fragmentation of presidential leadership. I'm hoping we can find someone we'll stick with for eight years. Well, I'd, I'd like to see that, too, but I'd want to have a midterm exam for him. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I agree. Uh, I don't think we want to make that decision at the outset. Well, we've started, uh, we've started what I guess inevitably must be the agenda for, for talking about politics in the 80s. We've I think you've indicated who you think are the two most likely possibilities, Reagan and Kennedy, allowing 
for the fact that there's still many months mm -hmm. to go before mm -hmm. that's nailed down. What other, uh, on the Democratic side, if Carter stays in, obviously a battle between Carter and Kennedy, uh, what does, where does this leave Jerry Brown? I think it leaves him uh, in the wings. I mean, he'll be a candidate, he'll be out there, uh, but uh, it seems to me that the strength that he hoped to get will go largely to Senator Kennedy. Uh, his strategy now is that uh, he, will, he will run in the early primaries and hope to finish second to Senator Kennedy and thereby help to force President Carter out of the race mm -hmm. uh, on the assumption that a third place finish would be impossible for the president to continue over any long period of time. The president, as you know, has, has, has said categorically that he's in the race to stay. I have no doubt that he believes that right now. But if he should, if he should suffer a series of, of rather humili humiliating defeats in the, um, in the primary, say four third. or five in a row, and third place third finishes, place he, he'll have, he'd have to start thinking then about whether he could continue to govern effectively in the remaining year, uh, months of his administration. And I think under those circumstances, he might well um, have to reconsider that, mm. that view that he would stay in all the way. You've had some close contacts with Governor Brown. What do you think of him? I find him a very provocative and, and interesting person. Um, I think he, um, he's a, he is a rather opportunistic politician. I don't have a real sense of warmth about him toward people, uh, but I find him engaging, and I think that uh, he might well uh, do better in a campaign than, than most people think when he gets out there and has an opportunity to campaign. Certainly in a campaign with, uh, just against President Carter, I would have thought he uh, had a chance to do quite well because he would have been the natural vehicle, the only vehicle for the, for the great uh, attitude that I see in the country uh, uh, against the president. Or not so much that it's against the president, that, that people don't like the president, uh, but they just uh, don't feel uh, he's doing, he's, he's up to the job. Mm -hmm. That certainly seems to be spreading. There, there really isn't much need to speculate on a, a, on a fourth possibility on the Democratic side, is there? It seems I don't see any, uh, as long as those three people um, stay in the picture, I would think that uh, there'd be plenty. Mm -hmm. Now Reagan, you have said, uh, has the organization, has the head start, is a skillful handler uh, of, of campaign audiences, so probably is, is still clearly in the lead. Who else might uh, come out of the pack? Well, I think, um, again, if the nomination were held tomorrow, I think Reagan would, would clearly win. He's, got, he's man managed to keep his support uh, that he's had all year without really campaigning. He's, he's kept a very low profile. And the other candidates have, have tried to campaign and cut into that lead and, and haven't. I think the one possibility that I see is that if something should happen affecting that highlighting Governor Reagan's age and the fact that, that he may not be up to the job, that I think could change the whole picture. He's, uh, he's, he's approaching 69. If elected, he'd be 70, 17 days after his election. Anything that might happen in, in the next months that would somehow point up to that as an illness or a hospitalization or something like that could change the whole picture. If that were the case, I would see um, uh, Governor Connolly uh, or Senate Minority Leader Baker as the two most uh, formidable uh, possibilities. Mm -hmm. They're um, rather different personalities, I think. They are. I think Connolly uh, meets the, uh, the uh, seems to, uh, to uh, meet to some degree the yearning for a strong person, but I may, he may be too much of a good thing. I think he comes mm -hmm. on so strongly that uh, he gives some people some concern. That he's just uh, he's just uh, too strong, and he has that image of being a wielder dealer that people don't. Yeah, don't like. it may not be entirely fair, and after all, the milk thing didn't stick in court. Uh, but I guess there's still a little whiff of Nixonism that that lingers about Connolly that bothers some people. I think also, you know, he's he's kind of a look-alike of, of of his old friend Lyndon Johnson. He is a Texan. I do. He has the, a lot of the mannerisms. He's he's, he's got the same self-confidence. And uh, I think maybe people associate him just as much uh, in a negative way with the things they didn't like about mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson than they do of any association mm -hmm. with, uh, with Nixon. We had here last year uh, Ben Wattenberg, who was involved, of course, pretty heavily with the Johnson administration and not entirely an objective observer of it, as he would admit, I think, who was quite high in Johnson and still feels he was a very effective president in many ways. You, Go along with that. We we'll go along with that, uh, with uh, with one exception, and that is, of course, the big exception is is the, is the war in Vietnam. I think that if there hadn't been, if there hadn't been an involvement in Vietnam, 
and he hadn't uh, intensified American involvement in Vietnam, that uh, a number of the things that he did on the domestic side and tried to do would have marked him as one of our better presidents. But I think that the whole of Vietnam experience so poisoned the well for the whole, in the whole country and for everything that Johnson uh, did or tried to do domestically that, um, that it's hard to take a, take a positive reading of them, in my mind, uh, uh, because you can't rule out which, what, after all, was the dominant uh, 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 political element in his whole administration, which ultimately was the factor that led to him uh, that withdrawing. Was the albatross. He did withdraw. He didn't lose the New Hampshire primary, as many people think he did, mm -hmm. but that was certainly a shock to him, I think, to see it that close. I, t I wonder, though, if he had, had hung in, if he might not have been able to have been reelected. No, I don't think so, because uh, the second primary, um, he also lost. He withdrew two days before the Wisconsin primary, but his name was still on the ballot. And uh, every evidence that, that there was, including uh, the, um, the assessments of his own people, who I talked to in, in Wisconsin uh, the day after he withdrew, indicated that he was going to lose in Wisconsin as well. Hmm. So they were anticipating finished. that. Yeah. What are your plans for this coming year? Are you going to cover the conventions uh, on the site? or? Oh, sure. I'll be, I'll be doing it from start to finish, uh, primary. going to all the primary states and all the caucus states and uh, trying to keep body and soul together at the same time. What do you usually do? Do you, do you travel with some of the, uh, the campaign teams or do you go on your own? In the primaries, or do the press in the primaries, have a plane go up from Washington. Not in the primaries, though. In the primaries, you uh, will go from one state to another, uh, pretty much on my own, and uh, and spend my time uh, going from one candidate to another and, and trying to make an independent assessment of the, of, of the campaign from primary to primary. In the general election, what I'll do is probably travel with 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 one of the other candidates on his plane. Uh, part of the time and then go out into the states and, and try to take readings of my own mm -hmm. uh, around the country. I should think that um, it's impossible for a candidate to be on all the time. I would think traveling with them on one of those junkets would be a good way to see the the, the great man with his uh, facade down. So well, it really is. The travel with the, with the candidate is quite educational because you do get a chance to get associated with them on a very close-up basis. But there, there's in recent uh, years been, been some inhibition to that, and that is that there's, there's been a, uh, uh, a penchant in, in the press to cover the press. That is, to, to write stories about other people who are writing stories about the press and to, and to cover every, every moment of the candidate uh, on the record. Um, there was a time when I would, could travel with a presidential candidate on his plane, sit down with him, have a casual conversation just between the two of us, which, which could be on or off the record, and get, get a feel of him. And I think it's very important to be able to do that, even if you don't write anything out of a particular conversation, but just to have a sense of who a candidate is and, and, and what motivates them and so on. In, uh, in recent campaigns, uh, if, you, if you do that, uh, you'll be talking to the candidate and you look over your shoulder and some other reporter has a, has a microphone mm -hmm. over your shoulder or a camera is it's running. Too bad, yeah. and, so, and so it's very, very difficult now uh, to have those private moments that, that in the past have been very revealing to somebody like me who not, not only just writes the straight uh, news account but tries to, to make some kind of an assessment and analysis of, of who a candidate is and what he's all about. There is a possibility, at least, that the Democratic uh, Convention might be really split going right into the voting, uh, with perhaps Brown carrying an important pocket of votes. Uh, Brown and Kennedy, I don't think Brown would go on the ticket with Kennedy. Uh, in the first place, uh, while religion is not the factor it used to be, you'd have a ticket with two Roman Catholics, which would violate some of the balancing principles. Well, I think that I think that alone would would preclude that possibility, and I think the other thing was that they don't get along that well. They so don't, I think that would, and it would be a, a kind of an odd. Yeah, coupling. I don't think I don't think Senator Kennedy, if he were the nominee, would want somebody who was who was such a freelancer mm -hmm. being his uh, being that the would, vice president. It make uh, I think Brown as vice president would make the president a little nervous. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thank you very much. This is gone by very rapidly, which perhaps is just as well considering these lights and the effect they're having on us.
Uh, I want to thank you very much, not just for the program today, but your whole visit. Thank you very much. It was uh, most edifying. And before we sign off, I would just like to remind our viewers that Dr. June Goodfield will be here uh, starting mon Monday, October 22nd, mainly uh, uh, known for her work in genetics. And uh, uh, she's been on the staffs at Rockefeller and Cornell. Science into the 80s will be the theme uh, in October. And then without going into details, uh, but just alerting the viewers that uh, that will be followed in November by Tom Wolfe, the uh, novelist and journalist. Ray Brady uh, on economics will be here in March. The, the famous uh, sports writer and in general essayist and humorist Haywood Hale Broon in uh, April and the Reverend Ralph Abernathy of the uh, uh, Southern Leadership Conference uh, here in, Wednesday, uh, in May. So we're looking forward to the whole series. I think it's gotten off to a great start. Uh, our guest has been uh, Mr. Jules Whitcover of the uh, Washington Star, uh, and uh, we've enjoyed his visit very much, and we thank you all for viewing Community Camera.